is to try to bring out some information that possibly you didn't know about or for some reason people have been using on you and you didn't realize that you were being deceived. You see, we live in an information age now where a lot of times things are done for effect as opposed to fact. A lot of people seem to have the presumption that <coughs> somehow their news service or the media is supposed to be reporting to you the facts and nowhere since history began has it ever been verified that anyone actually reports facts. They report perspective. They report things that generate interest and cause people to want to pay attention to that particular report. So that way you either are given information in a certain way presentation wise so that you would be watching it or get involved in it or else why would they do it? Because they want you to pay attention. So in order to get your attention a lot of times there's what's called hype or hyperbole. Things that are done just for effect to cause you to pay attention. Like I could go and jump up and down and shout and scream and maybe you pay attention. But after a while you would get bored with that. And so what there are is that there's been this new postulating by the news medias and by information age executives to present information in such a way that you're not getting facts and you're not getting truth. You're getting what's called fallacy. And that's why we call it educating media. Because you're being presented a certain number of facts which may or may not be strewn or spun in a certain way in order to give a perspective from one person's point of view, meaning that either conservative or liberal or progressive or retrogressive, whatever you want to call it, that everyone has an agenda and based upon that agenda is how they're presenting information. Why? Why can't we, based upon our own understanding and our own need at the point in time, the facts as they are and let us decide what we're going to do with those facts? Well, the reason is simple. It's called money. And everybody that presents information is doing it for a certain perspective of money, either by way of direct reciprocity, meaning that they immediately receive some kind of remuneration of monies, or by indirect reciprocity, meaning that they receive some kind of monetary gain or satisfaction that would be generated into a monetary gain in some way of their own ego or their own need to have readership of some type. So because of that, we have executives that are in advertising, in business, in politics, in government, in religion, and we've looked at that in this series of 38 dishonest tricks of argument of how even in religion itself now people are using fallacy in order to promote faith. That's false. You get an F in my class. <laughs> but we demonstrated how that was being done on a regular basis. But we also talked about in each one of these series where you will benefit from studying fallacy so that you will examine things a little closer. You'll be able to look at and see immediately when someone's stringing you a line or you know, using this idea of critical thinking, you can begin to look at things a little bit different perspective, not as a cynic, but know when someone's just telling you a uh, load of you know what. Because guess what? You no longer fall for it because you've been educated to watch for it. You no longer buy into the ad, the argument, for instance, some of the age-old salesman gimmicks like, we know, or you know, no we don't, and I don't know. You know, don't try to use a gimmick on me. And the gimmick of you know is a fallacy. The gimmick of we know is another type of fallacy. Each one of those are called 38 dishonest tricks of argument that we were saying in six overview tapes, presenting each one of those as just a kind of a taste of it because we're going to get into in-depth classes on fallacy and begin to go through it step by step in each one with detailed information, you know, trying to get a handle on it religiously, morally, politically, and maybe emotionally of how these are being done and manipulated by lots of means in order to influence you and peddle you off with your influence in certain ways which would be, pardon me, called deception. And because of that, and we know that there's going to come a deception upon the whole world. We would rather educate you now so that you would look at the scriptures with an accurate eye, understanding that you can know the truth and the truth can set you free. 
and that you can look at the world in a better way if you are educated to watch for those tricks of the trade that are being done by worldly men and women who have begun to use those in Christianity to their own benefit. Even sometimes in theological circles where they don't necessarily, and this is sad, but in fallacy you could actually not know you're doing it and be doing it because you're putting together some inaccurate pieces of information that don't go together and they're called non sequiturs. They don't fit together. You don't go from A to Z by going through G, D, A, C. In other words, you're stringing it along you know, and it's a string huh? and we're being strung along all right. But the point being is that in going through these arguments we've gone through four of them already and if you're looking for number four, so am I. I I recorded it, I posted it, I know, but I think it's got the wrong title, so I'm going to have to go back and try to find it. But now we're on the fifth one of six, and we're going to go over those and just begin to explain each one of these, because what they're from is that on Hebrew for Christians, as we mentioned in each one of these uh, 38 dishonest tricks of argument, that on the uh, Hebrew for Christians website, www Hebrew for Christians, they have a section that's called clear thinking that we wanted to recommend to people so that they could get these printouts themselves, go through it, read it, understand it, maybe understand it. If not, get the video, maybe I'll help you to understand it. But um, to look at that so that you would begin to understand logic and examination of fact from fallacy. Because fallacy is the idea that you would put, oh, a little bit of information in there, a little bit of uh, facts in there, and then slip in one lie to come to a false conclusion. It's done all the time. You may not have realized it, but it's being done today to everyone in many ways that, unfortunately, as we looked at in the last four, yeah, four videos is being used every day even in the media. Like uh, the latest one that I can think of would be this Trevor, whatever his name is case. You know, it's already being convicted, tried, done in the media, news, and people are misconstruing facts they don't know and then saying, Always, be, always making out someone to be innocent, the victim, that for some reason they don't add the other parts of the story to all of it when we don't know the facts yet. That's a technique of fallacy when you don't know the facts to construe them in a false way. Um, I don't think, yeah, it's appeal to prejudice. It's in, right now, as a matter of fact, that's kind of interesting is that right now we have in our country one of these ones that we're going to go through is called Appeal to Prejudice. And that's one of the ones we're reviewing. So instead of going through these in order, we'll just start off with the six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, six of them. And the first one we'll go to is called Appeal to Prejudice. And what it says is, statement of a doubtful proposition in such a way that it fits with the thought habits or the prejudices of the hearer. Approach, a habit of questioning what appears obvious is the best safeguard against this trick. A particular device of value against it is the uh, is to restate a questionable proposition in a new context in which one's thought habits do not lead to its acceptance. In other words, appeal to prejudice is the idea that, let's use it in the news today. There's a, a young man who was caught in a, a questionable area of town that he was not supposed to be in necessarily, that was being followed by a security guard who was doing his job, who was supposed to confront people and to ask them because there had been a lot of break-ins about what he was doing there. So somehow there was an altercation Something happened. Uh, eyewitness says that he saw the security guard being, you know, beaten by the person in question. And then the next time that he went to go call 911, next time that he looked, he saw that the security guard had shot the person, and the person was dead. Now, according to the news reports and according to everything that was there at the time, the security guard said that, or we could we call him a community neighborhood watch but since he was in security and he was doing a neighborhood watch and it was part of that community's idea of providing security for it it's basically a security guard so basically he was trained and he had a permit to carry a gun so because that was part of his job he's like a security guard so you don't need to really call him a neighborhood watch because it sounds like nobody knowing what they're doing but if you're if you have a gun hello <laughs> you're kind of trained for it in some way so in that respect of what he was doing, he was in an official capacity, operating within the parameters that he had, and then suddenly now we have this young man, because he's unarmed, all of a sudden being purely innocent, according to the media, 
thousands of people around the country rallying around the side of this person, whom apparently his previous history he has lots of, or he has some run-ins with law at school. You know, he has some run-ins with some certain situations. You know, and because he happens to be black and wore a hoodie, there's a appeal to prejudice. It is being construed as some kind of racial motivation, and yet the person who shot him is not racially motivated. So you see, right now in the country, we're seeing the news media portraying this on the one hand as an appeal to prejudice, but then as each day progresses when more facts come out and it begins to look like the security guard is not guilty, then they begin to change the story to fit the new facts that they've got. You see, they change it. They have appealed to you for the first story. Now that they got you hooked, they're going to slowly pull you in, but backtrack away from their avid attack on what got you involved in the first place. Because after all, what did you hear the first time that you ever heard it? On our man, shot, killed, innocent kid, going to the store for cookies or candy. Right, but nobody asked, what time of night was he out doing this? Um, what was going on at the time, and was it direct relationship to where he was supposed to be? Um, what were the rest of the facts as far as the security guard was concerned? And you never heard about that until a few days later. And then finally an eyewitness came out and says, look, hey, I saw it, you know, here's the story, you know. Because he was already exonerated, they didn't even bother the eyewitness. Now it's like, oh, well, the police rushed to a conclusion. Right. Appeal to prejudice, because you see, once ministers, black, got involved, then they started screaming that there's no white ministers involved. Appeal to prejudice. Then, once the Christians were involved, they started appealing to the government because they weren't involved. Appeal to prejudice. Oh, well, we got to get involved, so now we got to send, you know, a special investigator, you know, in order to make sure that this isn't a hate crime. You know, so there's appeal to prejudice going on. Do you see how that works? Everything is done because of the racial overtones. If this was done towards a white person who happened to be wearing a hoodie, there wouldn't be that same appeal to prejudice. It would be, hey, you know, the security guard was doing his job, you know. Or if the security guard happened to be a police officer and he shot him, hey, you know, he's doing his job. If it was white to white. But you see how the racial overtones make this appeal to prejudice? Appeal to prejudice is just appealing to any group or any bias you may have, for instance, I can give you another one, would be like in the Christian circle when suddenly, you know, it's like, oh, well, President Obama is not a Christian because he's not one of our types of Christians. Oh, never mind that he went to a church for 17 years, even though we don't like that church, even though it's listed as a Christian church, even though it is in the index of Christian churches. Never mind about that. Sorry. Doesn't count. Even though the pastor says, yeah, I've you know, baptized him, I've done this stuff, you know, and everything. Those don't count. He has to meet our criteria. You see how that works? Calling the president a Muslim is an appeal to prejudice. You know, same idea. Is that lots of times people want to make up stories about somebody they don't like, so they appeal to prejudice. They go, oh, he can't be a Christian. He's, he's a Muslim. So appealing to the fear factor of America today, there are people out there that are misconstruing facts and lying about the President of the United States to try to make him sound like he's a Muslim. No, he's not. Muslims know it. The President knows it. God knows it. How come you don't? In other words, appeal to prejudice. Very legitimate reason a woman said to me on the internet just recently, well, I see all these videos about it. Well, yeah, you do. Because there is a smear tactic of putting out information falsely about people at different times all over the place. And that's why we are confronted every day by fallacy. Things that are trying to deviate us from the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh the Father but by me. He also said, nothing that is concealed will not be revealed, but that it would be shouted from the rooftops. All you got to do is wait. All the facts come out. Quit jumping on the bandwagon and being caught up in the appeal to prejudice like a crowd angrily waiting for their pound of flesh. Appeal to prejudice will always work in a lot of ways because it does attack our base nature and it provokes us into fear and fear always provokes us into some kind of response. Unfortunately, if you're a mature Christian and perfect love casts out fear because you love the person, appeal to prejudice doesn't work because you're not prejudiced. 
you may have biases, but you're not prejudiced. You see how that works? A field of prejudice has to find something inside you in order for it to work. Another one of the uh, fallacies is called appeal to authority. Appeal to authority, which is interesting, also falls into that same parameter of just what we were talking about with this you know, police case and whether or not the security guard overstepped his bounds, you see. If it was a cop, we would agree. No, you wouldn't. If it was a police officer, you'd be just as mad. The guy was unarmed. So we appeal to a higher authority. Now they want the attorney general to come in. They want the FBI to come in. They want somebody to prosecute him. And they've already said, we don't have enough evidence. There's not enough evidence to prosecute him because he's probably not guilty. But, you see, the crowd wants to appeal to authority thinking that there will be some kind of better results. So, by way of saying, hey, you know, we want to bring more headlines into this. That's an appeal to authority. It's trying to prejudice people into thinking the person is guilty by crying out for a bigger authority to come down and to come up with the same conclusion. Uh, the guy did what he was supposed to do. And then they, the appeal to authority is to look at the law and say, well, the law, you know, the law is wrong. And everybody's jumping on that. They said, well, you know, it really wasn't designed for this, but the law is the law. If the law fits, it fits. It applies to everyone equally. At least that's supposed to, in our democracy with the way the law applies. That applies to everyone in the given situations until the courts decide how the laws apply. So what they're trying to do is trying to convict someone without a law to do it. The person, unfortunately, within the parameters that it was given, and so much of the information that has been presented at this time, is not guilty. Although they may still try to present a case against him in some other way, shape, or form, because, unfortunately, innocence is not a good criteria for defending yourself in a land where people can be prejudiced and can use the law for their own benefit. Always be careful when appeal to authority goes on because Jesus said man looks on the outward things but God looks on the heart. We can appeal to God as our authority and let him decide and let him reveal it in his time or you can try to put man in charge and appeal to authority in that way and you're doing fallacy because whenever you put man appeal and his authority in charge or above what God has said, then you're actually being misled by your own logic, thinking that man and humanism can come to a conclusion that only God can reveal by his Holy Spirit. So a lot of times, a lot of these fallacies always deal in the flesh. They deal in surface. They want to kind of like distract you from, no, don't ask God. We can take care of it. Right. Another one is getting to yes. <laughs> Tricky one. Just agree with me, you know. We agree to disagree agreeably. Overcoming resistance to a doubtful proposition by a preliminary statement of a few easily accepted ones. Getting to yes is kind of like you you say, well, are you a believer? Yes. Well, are you a Christian? Yes. Well, do you go to church? Yes. Well, then you're saved. No. <laughs> Being a Christian, going to church, and I forgot what the third one was already. I'd have to replay the tape. But using three affirmatives and then saying that you're saved is not an affirmative. In other words, that doesn't make you a Christian just because you agree on those three things. And that's how agreeing to yes works. It tries to get you to agree on certain things that, you know, it usually lists out more than three. It'll have a whole paragraph or pages of stuff that you agree with. You go, well, yeah, or like sometimes when they do in the economy, they'll say, well, you know we need health care. Well, yeah, you know, we know we need to cover everybody. Well, yeah, you know, you know we need to, um, you know, do it in such a way that everybody can afford it. Well, yeah, you know, you know we need to cover the rising health costs. Well, yeah, and you just keep going, yeah, 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 and then at the last minute they say, so we need to mandate, you know, everybody to get insurance in order to do it. No, <laughs> because just because you agree on all those points doesn't mean the conclusion is what you agree on. There are other alternatives. It forces you into trying to make an agreement just based upon the yes. That's phony. That's brainwashing you into, you know, um, if you repeat something over again, although there is another fallacy called repetition, you know, agreement by repetition. But the 
presenting of yes agreements or yes statements in order to get you to buy into the lie sometimes doesn't occur just at the end. It'll be mixed in somewhere. So you always have to be careful what you read, what you see, what you hear, what you are assenting to or agreeing with because that will mislead your own mind into agreeing. We've seen that on the internet where a lot of times where people will put out these little cute statements that have, you know, can you find the mistake in this this letter, you know, or the in this letter, and it'll say T H I I S, and you won't see the two eyes because your mind automatically has read all the other parts that has no mistakes, and it flashes by the one mistake. Sometimes, not always, but you know, most people do, and so that's also kind of like a demonstration of a getting to yes fallacy. Another fallacy is faulty assumptions. Boy. <laughs> The use of generally accepted formula of pre-digested thought as premises in argument. The faulty assumptions is saying things like, we know, and then whatever they're going to say the next part is, they'll try to make it sound like, you know, well, we know that all Christians go to church. No, we don't know that because some Christians don't go to church. We know, and some Christians go to a temple or they go to whatever it may be, you know, some other type of form of congregational setting. Um, home Bible study is a church, but that doesn't mean all Christians go to church. So you see, it's kind of, you know. But the faulty assumption is always putting something out there that is assumed to be true, but isn't true, because you can find an exception to it. The way to beat faulty assumptions is to see, are there any exceptions? Because God's word doesn't work that way. So as soon as you can find the exception, you know you're being misled. The assumptions always present themselves in a way that at first reading, when you first look at it, you go, oh yeah, that sounds right. Don't ever go by that word, sounds right. Don't ever trust yourself to believe in something that appears right. Question it. Ask questions. You are meant to ask who, what, where, when, how, why, where does this extend to? What happens about this? What are the ramifications of it? Does it extend only temporary or is it permanent? Does it cause certain ramifications down the road that you know are snowballing into other extenuating circumstances that would go on to bigger pictures, you know, that you haven't covered everything? Because always in an argument it wants to narrow the focus down to one thing you can agree on so that you'll be misled. Because if you can be off one tenth of a degree when you're looking at the moon, you'll be completely missing it if you're taking a moonshot. That's the point of fallacy. One little error, you're off the wall. Faulty assumptions does that. It will present usually lots of faulty assumptions that are just kind of like saying, hey, you know, all white people, you know, they, they do this, or all black people do this, or all Mexicans do this, or all Latinos do this, or all Chinese people do this, or all people... It, one of the famous faulty assumptions is Muslims. You know, all Muslims want to kill you. That's a faulty assumption. That's not true. No, they don't. A lot of people just simply want to live a life and enjoy it for their own benefit. That's the bottom line. People are not prejudicial in the way that you might present them because there are a lot of faulty assumptions being presented about Islam itself. Until you actually do a research for yourself and you meet someone that's a Muslim, quit making up these phony excuses about what they call Sharia law or Muslims. You don't know. You're just being told what you want to hear because you're being prejudicially presented false assumptions. And those false assumptions will mislead you into thinking that all Muslims want Sharia law for everyone. And they don't. They want it for themselves. Pardon me, but the reason why they want to go by... A lot of times why people want to use their own set of laws is because our set of laws aren't strict enough. They don't fit whatever set of circumstances they want. Jewish law is very much that way. There are Orthodox Jews that will say, hey, look, you know what? You can tell me all day long that your law says that you know I can walk as far as I want to on the Sabbath. But guess what? Jewish law says, no, I can only walk this many feet. And they'll obey that. Now, you don't see everyone jumping up and down, shouting and screaming that Jews are trying to take over the judiciary system. Of course, they already think that every lawyer is a Jew, but anyways. <laughs> but you don't hear that, do you? The same thing is true about Sharia law. It's not about some criteria that somebody's taking out of, blowing out of proportion some law that they found in it. It's rather they want to keep to themselves a certain criteria of religious observance. If the person isn't observing that law, it doesn't fit for them. If a person is observing that law, then Sharia law applies to them. That's the whole point about halakhic law, is that halachot, or the, the Talmudic reasoning behind the law that is given in Jewish court, is so that people would arrange their religious life accordingly. And that's what you realize. It's about religious life that extenuates themselves into social life because that's how they conduct themselves. If it says that they want to wear a hat, you got to wear a hat. If you walked into their, same thing in Orthodox community, if you walk into an Orthodox temple, you're getting a kippah. You know, you're getting one put on you. <laughs> 
pardon me, but you're not coming in because you've got the freedom to express yourself any way you want to. You ain't coming in. That's the way it is. That's why in faulty assumptions, people make those wrong decisions based upon some faulty assumption about the law itself, rather the reason why it's there. So they don't make the correct questions. You need to question everything. Another fallacy is called appeal to ignorance. There is so much to be said on both sides, so no decision can be made either way, or any formula leading to the attitude of academic detachment. It's like saying... <laughs> Appeal to ignorance is simply that, well, you don't know, but if you were like me, you know, and understood how much I know about it, then, you know, you, you, you'd agree with me, you know, or we don't know enough of the facts, so we're going to agree that nobody knows, so, one of the, okay, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a better one. It's one of the most famous ones that are, it's used in religious circles right now today, and it is appeal to ignorance. It's called, no man knoweth the day or the hour. Well, that's not true. Jesus, when he went to heaven, he went back into the book of Revelation. You look in there, it says, Revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him that you know should be revealed to the servants, you know, blah, blah, blah. So God gave unto him the revelation that he would know possibly you know what time or seasons. He already knows that. He already knows because he told us that at times and seasons. As far as the exact moment criteria, God will say, go, and he'll go. But the point is, is that when it said, no man knoweth the day or the hour that the Son of Man will return, that didn't mean that we wouldn't know the times in the year, so people are appealing to ignorance by saying, well, you can't know it because he said no day or the hour. Well, you can know it because you can get pretty close within a day or within two days because it's not the day or the hour, or let's see, within a week because after you narrow down what comes after in measures of time after a day, it doesn't come to, you know, midday or, let's see, there used to be a word for fortnight. It's not a fortnight, although you probably could do fortnight, you know, get in there with you know, kind of like three days there. You know, but we're not Old English. But in the Jewish frame of mind, what comes after a day is a week. So you could know the week. Or you could know the ten-day period, or whichever way you want to look at that as far as which you think the tribulation period is or when you think the rapture is. So that appeal to ignorance is people saying when they don't want to study or they don't want to believe that Jesus is coming, they'll say, well, nobody knows. You know, and that's an appeal to ignorance. The facts are, Jesus gave a criteria, Paul gave a criteria, he told us to watch, he told us to be ready, he told us what to watch for, he told us what to be ready for. That's the bottom line. We're supposed to know. We should know. And that's an appeal to ignorance. When you don't know and you say you can't know, that's the appeal to ignorance. You don't know the day or the hour, but you do know the weeks, or week, or month, or year even, of when the Son of Man will return. Bottom line. It's a fact. But the appeal to ignorance tries to make you think you can't know. And that's an appeal to ignorance. In all of these, the only way that you can properly understand and to move forward in life is to study these in depth, as we're going to do. But in this overview, the only thing I want you to do is just be aware of them as we've explained them, that they are happening not just in the world with business, with judiciary, with news media, whichever side you're on, happens on both sides, or that is happening somewhere in a faraway land. It's happening in your church, it's happening with your pastor, it's happening with your teacher, it's happening with your elders, it's happening with your deacon, it's happening with everyone around you. Because people, when they're presenting information lots of times, don't even realize sometimes that they're committing a fallacy. Because they don't do their homework. So, study to show thyself a fruit of work and need not be shamed by the word of truth, but trust in the Lord, don't trust in men.